Ladies and gents, it is with great pleasure that Romy Haymans and I uh, welcome you to the Academic Conference 2020, jointly organized by UNESCO, Leiden University, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. My name is Bruce Mtsvairo, and Romy and I are going to be your hosts today. Yes, thank you, Bruce. And joining us today, we have conference organizer Jaap de Jong, professor of journalism and new media for the Leiden University Center of Linguistics, and Professor Guy Berger, director of policy and strategy in the field of communication and information at UNESCO. A very warm welcome to you both. Uh, great to have you uh, in the studio today. Thanks, Romy. Uh, this conference consists of four parts. First, the paper rounds, uh, during which authors introduce their papers through a short video followed directly by interactive chat sessions about the papers. Then we will continue with post around, introducing all posters through short videos. And finally, the interactive chat sessions about the posters. This year's World Press Freedom Conference is themed Journalism Without Fear or Favor. The conference commemorates World Press Freedom Day and the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. It aims to inspire and gather journalists, media companies, human rights defenders, academics, youth, NGOs, and anyone interested in press freedom worldwide. In today's academic conference, a group of renowned academics and journalists will show their research about the safety of journalism, an important and urgent topic which requires both theoretical reflection and practical solutions. Without, thank you, Romy. Without further ado, uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce with great honor and privilege, Professor Guy Berger. <clears throat> Over to you, Professor Berger. Well, thank you so much, uh, colleagues, and thank you to Leiden University for working with UNESCO in this, and thanks to the Foreign Ministry. You know, this conference says, I call it Press Freedom TV, because it's not your normal conference, and certainly it's not Zoom. All the participants here presenting and those of you who are watching, you're making history. Why? Because safety of journalists is something that more and more momentum is being built around the world. Prosecutors, judges, media, journalist organizations, NGOs, international groups, the UN itself, we're all getting more and more impetus on this. So you're making history. Thank you so much. Your scholarship has immediate policy relevance. Enjoy the discussions. Thank you, Professor Berger, for these warm words of welcome. Uh, as we move ahead, please allow me to introduce <coughs> Professor Jaap de Jong uh, uh, of Leiden University, who, along with his colleagues, helped organize this conference. For Leiden University, with establishments in both the old city of Leiden and The Hague, the city of peace and justice, it's an honor to host UNESCO's Academic Conference 2020. In December 2019, the Academic Committee, uh, consisting of Dr. Willem Koetsenreuter, Remco Broekers, Professor, and myself, sent out a call for research papers and posters. We were happy to see the rich harvest. After a rigorous selection process with the help of academic colleagues from 10 universities from all parts of the world and professors of the UNESCO chairs, we finally selected eight papers and 10 posters. Everything seemed well organized with the help of UNESCO, Foreign Affairs and Land University, and then COVID-19 kicked in. This COVID-19 certainly delayed the process, but did not change the context of this conference. We find polarization all around us and journalists continue to work in unsafe environments. Even here in the Netherlands, the national broadcast NOS decided to get rid of their logos on company cars to be less vulnerable to the harassment by bystanders. Even here, an attack took place at our national newspaper, The Telegraaf, not to mention daily threats posted to journalists on social media. In many countries, it is much worse, and academic research is necessary to form a foundation for improving these circumstances. Our conference today is called Safety of Journalists, Press Freedom and Media Capture. We need to stand up for free, independent media and protect journalism from new and existing forms of control. 
with press freedom under attack in so many countries, this has become now more relevant than ever. We have welcomed qualitative and quantitative research about methodology, about central themes and concepts in safety of journalism studies. During this conference, we'll see results of international questionnaires, comparative studies and discussions on the necessity and effects of media laws. And now, it's an honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Glenda Daniels. Glenda has worked as journalist in South Africa, and she is now associate professor of media studies at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. She has written many scholarly articles and important books, including Power and Loss in South African Journalism. Later, she will share her recent research with us in a paper presentation, but now she is going to speak in a short and captive video to us about journalism's power and responsibility for public service. Professor Daniels. Good day, everyone. Thank you very much, UNESCO, for inviting me to present this keynote address to the Conference on Safety of Journalism. The role of the journalist in a democracy is as critical as ever before, maybe not such a lofty aim. On February 14, 1994, Nelson Mandela, our then president, said that a critical, independent, investigative press is the lifeblood of any democracy. He also went on to say that this becomes a mirror to us. Why are we discussing the safety of journalists today? A new resolution on the safety of journalists by the United Nations Human Rights Council on the 6th of October 2020 was signed by 70 countries from all the world's regions, which signaled strong international commitment to end detention of journalists murders of journalists, violence against journalists, reprisal, surveillance of journalists, because as the COVID pandemic hits everywhere, the provision of vital information to the public and the sustainability of media environments becomes more important than ever. But journalism is more than, we call it, you know, there's this phrase, not just a crime. It's much more than that. It is critical in this age when facts are needed. In an age of populism, there's not just a COVID-19 pandemic, there's an infodemic pandemic. So we have the complexities of job losses. We have the complexities of social information, disinformation, digitization, all this being conflated with journalism. We have the trolling and harassment of journalists. But there's hope. And I write about this in Power and Loss in South African Journalism, News in the Age of Social Media, which applies not just to South Africa, but to the world East, West, North, South. I've got 10 points. Number one, the opportunity is now to demonstrate that power means responsibility and public service. Journalists' role has to be to make power accountable. We have to be reliable conduits of information to the public. Pressure must be put on media companies to actually help catch the trolls. So we have to ensure that media companies train more and fund more rather than lay off journalists and retrench and make redundant. The days of doing stories to sell the newspaper, those days are over. This is now a fantastic opportunity for journalists in the age of COVID to pivot to what matters, getting information, reliable, factual information out there to our public so that they can make decisions about their lives that better their lives. Today, the media, the giant media tech companies, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, have taken over the space and taken away advertising. This is now a new opportunity for research in our academic circles. What kind of alliances, number four, what kind of alliances are needed to tackle this problem, to tackle how we can get a fair tax from the big techs? The mental health issues that have come with journalists having to report during the age of COVID, which has always been there, but now this issue is coming to the fore, 
because of the trauma of COVID-19. And another research edge, which is also a double-edged sword, and research edge is the double-edged sword of social media. Not all social media is bad. It has enabled the hashtag Black Lives Matter. It's enabled the hashtag Me Too, but it has also enabled the lies of Trump and many other politicians. So number six, I say back to the basics. What does this include? Facts matter in the age of corruption and uh, social media enables spreading of lies. So I refer you to the book, The Elements of Journalism, Basic 101, which talks about the first obligation of journalism is to the truth. Now we say to the facts because there are so many truths. The first loyalty is to citizens. The essence of journalism is the discipline of verification. And we must maintain an independence from power and political parties. Number seven, diversity and inclusion. What do I mean by this? I mean bringing in the voices from the margins. A research in South Africa by Media Monitoring Africa has shown that 80% of the voices is covered by the elites in South Africa. In fact, Cyril Ramaphosa, our president's voice, was covered 80% of the time during the coverage on COVID-19. How fascinating is that? It reaffirms a lot of research areas which show that the margins continue to be left out by the media. So, number eight, changing the world through journalism by uncovering corruption, by having alliances, by bringing in the margins, bringing into the margins the voices that have been excluded, such as Black, poor, trans, feminist, gay, climate change activists. I could go on and on. So media is not just there for the voices of the powerful. Number nine, to win back credibility. What do we have to do? While the mission of journalism has not changed, journalists unfortunately have in this age of populism sided with political factions and politicians. And so you get one lot of journalists and another lot of journalists. Journalists for professional codes of ethics and journalists batting for that side. Not good enough. Number 10. So then number 10, I end on hopefully a very inspirational note. Good power. Bring in the voices from the margins which matter. And I've mentioned who they are. And this would be, we can create a more just society and a more just world if we use this power with responsibility towards public service. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Daniels, for delivering such a thought-provoking keynote. Uh, now we've got a Q&A. Uh, I've got some few questions for you. What needs to be done to help boost research in your area of focus, particularly in volatile regions of the world? Yes, hi. Um, I'd say the areas of focus would be how to save journalism from the world of misinformation seen on social media, how to spread awareness of the roles of the journalism in a democracy, and you spread the awareness, awareness to government, citizenry, and uh, private sectors. And thirdly, how to combat the online harassment, particularly of women journalists. And I think your second question was, what is most needed? It would be the awareness campaigns, given the above areas, uh, these awareness campaigns about the above two research. And secondly, research collaborations that must be global, actually, because this is, this is a global problem. There may be specificities locally, but there are overlaps globally in terms of what's going on right now. Very important indeed. Uh, thank you, Professor Daniels. What threats uh, uh, does social media pose to the future of journalism? Huge threats, um, because what is happening today is that people out there, because of media literacy problems, are unable to distinguish between journalism 
on the one hand and social media on the other hand. Journalism uses social media platforms, but journalism and social media, they just certainly are not the same thing. Uh, Facebook is not journalism and Twitter is not journalism. So because of the conflation and the collapse between the two, that poses a huge danger because of the spread of misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, malicious gossip and so forth. Really inspiring listening to you as always. Thank you so much, Professor Daniels. Yes, thanks again to Professor Daniels for inspiring Thank us you, with, her, with, with her keynote. Thank you so much. Uh, next on the program are the paper rounds in which all authors will present a summary of their research. But before we do, we would like to invite three special guests to our table, virtual table. Welcome Peter Tervelde, Kiran Nasish and Claudia Cadena. Peter Tevelde is a Dutch journalist with long-standing experience in crisis and conflict reporting. He has reported from Israel, Palestine and Lebanon, among other crisis hotspots. Yes, and Kiran Nazish is an independent Pakistani journalist. She has worked as a foreign correspondent around the world, including the Middle East and South Asia. Nazish founded the Coalition for Women in Journalism, a worldwide support organization for female journalists. And then we have Claudia Cadena. Uh, uh, she is uh, a development specialist focused on promotion of democracy, uh, governance, and human rights. She leads programs supporting civil society development, press freedom, and freedom of expression in Latin America. A warm welcome to you all. First, I will explain the logistics for our guests. Uh, there will be three consecutive paper rounds, each containing either two or three videos of paper presentations. First, paper round one, with the theme Safety of Journalists in Challenging Environments, will feature the research of Cristiana Bonfim and Eulalia Camursa, and that of Sarah Torsner, Jackie, Jackie Harrison, Abana Shala, and Silvia Chocaro. Paper round two is all about safety of female journalists. This theme features work by our very own keynote speaker, Glenda Daniels, as well as Sadia Jamil and Elizabeth Witchell. And lastly, paper round three focuses on local politics and safety of journalism. In this round, Babak Bahador and Adepate Mustafa Koeki, Kyung Masaro and Michelle Betts will present their research. These short presentations will be followed up by the paper chat sessions on which we will elaborate later on. Let's start with paper round one. Journalists work under challenging circumstances in challenging places. Their desk, uh, as well as the field they work in, can be a challenging environment. Whether they live in a country where being a journalist is a risk job or whether they do their work under harsh circumstances like crisis or war. Threats can be physical, but, in the, uh, but the digital environment can also present threats to journalists. On average, every five days, a journalist is killed for bringing information to the public, according to UNESCO. Data from the Committee to Protect Journalists show 23 journalists have been killed in 2020, 248 imprisoned in 2019, while 64 are missing globally. These staggering statistics demonstrate why our paper round one is focusing on the safety of journalists in challenging environments. To help us make sense of this important issue, Cristiana Bonfim and Eulalia Camursa are here. Cristiano Bonfim is a Brazilian journalist and the national and international editor of Diario do Nordeste Fortaleza. She is the former director of the Professional Journalists Union of her state and a journalism graduate of the Federal University of Cairo. Eul Eulalia Camu Camuca is also from Brazil and a doctoral student in constitutional law at the Federal University of Cairo. She currently works as a professor in various subjects, among which law and youth, ethics and web journalism. We evaluate whether the performance of public representatives in Brazil can limit the work of journalists in any way or contribute to creating risks for these professionals, 
In the case of the independent magazine Asmina, we consider that addressing issues related to women's repro reproductive rights, such as safe abortion, can generate reactions that negatively impact the freedom of expression of media professionals in Brazil. Based on the analysis of the case of the independent magazine Asmina, we interviewed a journalist from the magazine who is a manager. We chose to preserve the name and function. She commented on the various consequences of the Minister of Women, Family and Human Rights of Brazil, having shared the report on Twitter stating that she would make a complaint. The minister had 546,000 followers on the social network. As Mina Magazine was investigated by a police station in Sao Paulo, a state of Brazil. It is important to monitor possible legal repercussions of this case, especially because it involves issues related to the right to information and because she is a concern regarding the plurality of guidelines in the media. Asmina has a woman-only newsroom and is an independent vehicle that performs coverage that is still considered taboo. Our source in Asmina said that the minister has incited thousands of internet users to attack journalists in the magazine. Next up is a discussion on the link between uh, media literate citizenry and the unsafety of journalism. Sitting on the panel is Dr. Sarah Tosna. She is a postdoctoral research associate at the Center for Freedom of Media at the University of Sheffield in the UK. Jackie Harrison is a professor of public communication and UNESCO chair on media freedom and journalism safety at the University of Sheffield in the UK. Albana Shala is a media practitioner and human rights defender working as a program coordinator at Freedom of uh, Free Press Unlimited. She is also UNESCO's IPDC Council former chair. Silvia Tocaro is a consultant on freedom of expression and media development issues for international organizations and each NGOs. This research looks at the link between the safety of journalists and, and media and information literacy. So, what is the link? We ask whether a media and information literate society is more likely to protect journalism and journalists against attacks. The research looks at this issue from the perspective of one, understanding the relationship of trust between media and its audiences, and two, between journalism and a well-informed citizenry. We are interested in how media and information literacy can be used as a tool to foster understanding about the role of journalism among the public, and whether this understanding will create a public able to resist attempts to silence journalism and journalists. Our research argues that we must re-engage with how to understand media and information literacy, to understand how it can be used as a means to counter attacks on journalists. So, accordingly, media and information literacy should be understood not only as a means for citizens to critically evaluate media messages, but also to facilitate a broader understanding of what uh, the value of journalism is and why it is important. And media and information literacy conceptualized in this way uh, can become a tool uh, to formulate counter narratives to those rejecting uh, the value of journalism and peddling mistrust in journalism. And it can equip uh, the audience with the capacity to defend journalism against attack.
we have examined a number of case studies to understand how a strong relationship of trust uh, between journalism and communities of audiences through media and information literacy can serve to protect journalism in contexts of media repression by creating what we call uh, pockets of resistance. So what we're planning to do is to follow up these tentative empirical findings uh, with a systematic, systematic empirical study of the role of communities of audiences in protecting journalism through expressions of solidarity uh, that articulate an understanding of the societal value of journalism. To shed some more light on this subject, we would like to welcome Dutch journalist Peter Tevelde to our studio. Welcome, Peter, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Could you perhaps begin by updating us on the state of play on the link between uh, a media literate citizenry and the unsafety of journalism? Yeah, it's, it's of course an interesting topic and a difficult topic as well. Um, what we see in recent years, especially in the uh, Western world, is that uh, journalism comes more and more under um, um, pressure uh, because of aggression and violence towards a journalist. Um, you just said that I'm a journalist. Yeah, I was a journalist. I've been uh, for 20 years in crisis and war zones, and there it was obvious um, that I had to deal with aggression and violence and all that kind of uh, uh, kind of things, especially in the Middle East and Afghanistan, Iraq, and all the countries I've been. But nowadays we see it a lot in our Western countries, and that's the biggest worry I think for the Western societies, the Western democracies, that we um, that that journalism is really under um, pressure. Um, Leading here, I'm the project leader of a, um, a project in the Netherlands that is called Press Safety, that deals with um, uh, aggression and violence towards journalists. And we had only this year, 2020, so far, um, about around 120 uh, cases of violence and aggression threats to uh, journalists. And we're talking here about domestic uh, journalists in the Netherlands. Um, in Germany, it's more or less equal. Also, there, the, the the pressure on journalism is is huge. So, I think it's um, pretty much worrisome what we see in our society at the moment, especially by a undercurrent in the society that is very much against authority, against science, against media, against what they call the elite. Um, and I think COVID-19 didn't really help this year because this undercurrent in society has become stronger each day um, in the Western world. And that, that's the worry at this moment in our um, Western societies, I'm afraid. Thanks so much, uh, Peter. So what's the way forward? Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's difficult. I mean, we in the Netherlands also hear from our um, government, fortunately, uh, 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 the media gets a lot of support. Yeah. Uh, we had here in the Netherlands understandings, protocols with the police and the prosecutor's office to protect journalists more. Um, and police is really trying uh, to do its best, but it is hard. We will. We have to see how this development um, uh, goes in the next few years. And um, in that way, I'm not really optimistic, um, to be honest, because the, the the undercurrent in society, in Western society, and um, so far becomes stronger and stronger. Um, and it's not really a cause for optimism. What needs to be done to ensure the continued safety of journalists and pro-democracy activists uh, in non-Western societies? In non-Western societies, yeah, that's an, 
listen, the, the, we heard the, 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 the story about Brazil earlier. Um, of course, the, 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 uh, the others will confirm this. Um, most journalists who have to deal with aggression and violence are local journalists um, who have to deal with their own uh, governments. Like uh, the example in, in, in Brazil is very interesting. A magazine that writes about abortion, uh, abortion is a taboo. And suddenly this magazine uh, has to deal with an enormous pressure um, also from the prosecutor's office and um, they have to deal with a, um, a court case probably. Um, I mean, this kind of developments in countries like Brazil, where media is under enormous pressure, um, they need a lot of support from um, Western countries, those countries where journalism is strong and free, um, but also from the media from Western countries to stand up for them and to uh, support them. Technology, for example, uh, social media is said to be playing an important role uh, in promoting awareness on media literacy and safety of journalists. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's true. Um, but I'm afraid that a lot of people are uh, more or less in, in their bubble um, if it comes to social media. Um, so the people who are against the media, who are um, aggressive to the media, who are against authority, just, just the, the things I just mentioned, are in their bubble um, and they are only following um, the people, the organizations that confirm their own ideas already. Um, so, yeah, social media can still be used to, um, um, to promote good things, but I'm afraid that more and more people um, are in their own... Um, but let, let, for instance, let me take here the example here in the Netherlands by, uh, about the, the people who are um, against, for instance, the COVID measures. They are, um, most of them are extreme right wing. Um, they um, support extreme right wing uh, party. They believe in conspiracy theories. They don't believe the normal, what they call the mainstream media anymore. They get their news from Google, from YouTube, from Facebook. Um, it was just mentioned, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google, they are not media platforms, but for them, um, these are the only media platforms and they only get their news from there. Uh, so yes, as media organizations as other organizations here in the west yes and in, in in other countries we can still share our views or the news or and the comments on the news still through social media but these people they don't believe anything anymore i'm afraid very inspiring thank you very much uh, peter tevelde and now on to paper round two the safety of female journalists deserves its own topic during this conference. Uh, research has shown that female journalists face a double burden in that they get targeted both as journalists and as women. Women are confronted with violence and crisis situations in different ways than men are. This is a problem which needs addressing. Dr. Sadia Jamil is doing a lot of work in this area from her best at Khalifa University of Science and Technology, Abu Dhabi, where she is a postdoctoral fellow. Her research presented here discusses the unsafety of Pakistani female journalists facing not only sexual harassment and violence, but also gender discrimination. Dr. Jamil's paper aims to investigate Pakistani female journalists' lived experiences and analyze, analyzes the impact of the unsafe situations they encounter.
Hello everyone from Abu Dhabi. My name is Dr. Sadia Jamil. My research basically deals with uh, sexual harassment, discrimination and safety risk faced by Pakistani female journalists. The research has investigated three research questions. The first question is what are the lived experiences of Pakistani female journalists related to sexual harassment, discrimination and online and offline safety risk? The second research question is what are the sources of sexual harassment, safety risk for Pakistani female journalists? And the third question is how sexual harassment, discrimination and diverse type of safety risk impact their personal and professional lives. In terms of research findings, journalists who are working in television news channels, they are more prone to sexual harassment as compared to those who are working in Urdu and English language newspapers. Online safety risks such as social media trolling, abusive messages on emails and WhatsApp are quite common uh, experience of female journalists from Urdu and English language newspapers and television news channels. The main sources of discrimination, sexual harassment and safety risk are bosses, members of political organizations and religious leaders. And finally, this is to find a very good level of resilience among Pakistani female journalists to continue their work as a journalist because not many of them have change their profession as a journalist. In terms of the research contribution, I think one of the key contribution of this research is that it unpacks lived experiences of Pakistani female journalists which has not done before. Um, uh, many of the Pakistani female journalists, they are quite hesitant to talk about how they face sexual harassment and discrimination and different kind of safety risk. So I'm very grateful to all of them who participated in this research project. Um, as a subsequent research project, now, right now I'm working on a study that exclusively investigate how different kind of digital risk uh, impact Pakistani female journalists personal and professional lives, particularly in the post pandemic world. And now it is time for us to welcome back our keynote speaker, Professor Glenda Daniels. She is an associate professor of journalism at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Professor Daniels' research focuses on female journalists in South Africa, especially those who expose corruption. They face gendered and sexualized aggression in all contexts of their work. Professor Daniel's paper suggests some ways forward, analyzing press freedom in South Africa through the lens of these women. Hello, my name is Glenda Daniels from the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. My topic is power blocks and unraveling the myriad of unsafe spaces for women journalists in South Africa. My main research question is, what is the way forward? My results and way forward. Women journalists in South Africa work in a misogynistic environment which negatively impacts democracy, diversity of voice and indeed media freedom itself. The naming and shaming of bullies is important to end cyber misogyny. The results of bullying are trauma often resulting in mental breakdowns. Alliances and collaborations between civil society, governments, media companies and international organizations are necessary to catch the trolls. We must create supportive networks for those attacked women journalists. Thank you. The follow-up questions are, more research is needed on how to provide mental health support to women journalists. How to encourage women to stay in the spaces which are unsafe how to tackle the big tech media companies to take down violent messages against women journalists as quickly as possible, rather than put, it, put them down further on their web pages and websites, or to investigate before taking down the violence, hatred and misogyny. Thank you.
Elizabeth Witchell is an independent consultant with over 15 years of experience in the fields of human rights and international journalism. She consults international media support, an NGO which promotes press freedom, works to save journalists' lives and paves the way for good journalism. Witchell's report uh, explores how stakeholders can respond when journalists are attacked. The research also addresses the conditions that make journalism a risky profession. The question we sought to answer, or at least to further, is how can we address the foremost challenges to promoting safety of journalists, particularly within multi-stakeholder and collaborative frameworks? The starting point of this research was five standout challenges. One, gaining engagement by state actors in safety of journalists. Two, uniting disparate stakeholders into a durable action-oriented structure. Three, gaining more commitment from the media se sector itself into safety of journalists. And four, integrating a gender perspective throughout safety of journalist mechanisms. The fifth is strengthening tools for combating impunity. Our objective was to highlight how stakeholders are trying to address these challenges with the goal of informing and sharing good practices. We looked closely at six countries, Afghanistan, Colombia, Myanmar, Pakistan, Somalia, and the Philippines. In addition, the report also pulls in examples found in Mexico, Nepal, and other places where there are demonstrable relevant lessons. Our main findings are, Media state dialogues, as well as building allies and solidarity among civil society are key elements to promoting engagement by the state in safety of journalists. Two, uh, developing enduring multi-stakeholder mechanisms requires consensus, participation, and an anchoring body such as a national human rights institution or a coalition. In some contexts, a more decentralized approach is more effective. Three, the media sector can and should do more to promote and practice safety. Many measures require time and institutional commitments, but can be implemented at low cost. Four, uh, gender-specific threats and responses need a more comprehensive approach. Gender balance representation in the development of mechanisms is an important early step. Five, more tools to strengthen and scrutinize investigations are needed to combat impunity, including international monitoring teams and independent criminal investigations. Some useful points of follow-up to our research are reporting to gauge the impact over time of safety of journalist initiatives, further work to document good practices for justice that merge criminal and human rights frameworks. This would go towards improving investigations and it's something that IMS has already begun work on. Uh, practical materials to assist at-risk communities to implement good practices and a kind of COVID-19 damage assessment to see how much uh, the work um, safety of journalists work has really been set back. Thank you. To discuss this topic a little further, we would like to welcome Kiran Nazish from the Coalition for Women in Journalism to our studio. Welcome, Ms. Nazish. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Nazish, what stood out to you in the presentations that we have just watched? So first of all, they're all very important. Um, I think they all reveal some things that we have not been able to find a lot of context um, for in, um, in much of the work that is done on gender and women journalists um, in the industry. I do want to point out that uh, when we, uh, when our, my organization, the Coalition for Women in Journalism launched um, two years ago, there was almost very little, if none, um, research on women journalists in the industry and the diverse um, ways that women are attacked um, and, and face the challenges that they do. Um, so I think that one is it's very impressive that we have a lot of research going on and all of these papers reflect um, context in different regions, South Africa, Pakistan, which also covers the subcontinent a little bit. And uh, one of the researchers that really stood up for me was Elizabeth Witchell's um, work. This is a detailed book that sort of addresses 
um, various aspects of what is happening um, in journalism at large, which then affects women as well. Um, uh, the paper is called Shared Responsibility, Safeguarding Press Freedom in Perilous Times. Um, and this is indeed uh, a perilous time in, in several ways. Um, I think that this particular research, I really recommend um, you know, to consume this, um, to consult this, because it covers various aspects. Most of all, that we are, in terms of press freedom, we are in a perilous time. We see that the world is changing really fast democratically. Uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of changes in different parts of the world. Um, so I think that is something that is not going to go away very soon, which will inevitably affect media freedoms. And then when media freedoms get affected um, in an industry which is in going through a perilous time financially, um, that affects, um, that sort of trickles down. Um, and then we come to gender and I think that women in journalism essentially are, we're seeing in the last few years that are the recipient of uh, some of the most uh, you know, important challenges that we're facing in the industry with press freedom, um, you know, financial challenge, etc. Uh, COVID-19, that kind of increased all of these challenges as well. Um, uh, so I would I would say recommend I would recommend reading that there were certain feedbacks that I had from the experience that we have with working with the coalition for women in journalism we do work around the world we cover uh, women journalists and press freedom um, and do support work um, with women journalists in several countries. Um, so uh, there are certain lessons that we learned that we see that this research also gets into. I'm going to go over that. One of the most prominent things that I think is, um, is important to remember is the responsibility of media organizations. Um, obviously, this research shows uh, different things like stakeholders that um, can play a role in, uh, you know, making journalism more, more safe for journalists um, in general and then women journalists as well. Uh, but one of the key response, I think what we saw in different countries is that it really comes down to the media organizations. We know that there are there is a financial challenge um, that most um, media organizations are going um, you know, are under uh, the pressure uh, because of the financial challenge. And then there's the press freedom challenge. And these combined really affects how, what kind of safety media organizations can provide. But oftentimes what we have noticed um, is that uh, this has also become an excuse for media organizations to not offer the safety that they can. So one of the things that I would like to say as a recommendation is that we need to look into that, into working with media organizations um, and encouraging media organizations to offer safety. Um, when media organizations are able to offer safety to journalists who are you know, on the front line of press freedom challenges and women journalists who go through multitudes of challenges uh, with harassment, Harassment, political harassment, um, sexual harassment, etc., cetera, uh, blackmail, online trolling. We know all of these things, so I'm not going to go into enumerating all of those things, but I think this all comes down to really working with key institutions and media organizations is one of them. And second, um, because we don't have enough time to go into everything, second, I would say it's stakeholders. Um, in, in, in most countries where we see women journalists facing uh, press freedom challenges, we see that it's usually coming from powerful, either the state itself or other powerful parts of a country that want to attack press freedom. And then they, you know, they kind of organize um, campaigns against women journalists. So in that scenario, we do need to uh, find ways of collaborating with um, the opposition or other stakeholders that are interested in upholding democratic values of a country. Um, and that can really help in creating more awareness about what kind of challenges journalists are going through and women journalists are going through, as well as finding partners in this fight against press freedom and attacks on women journalists.
Yeah, thank you. Um, so I really wanted to discuss with you also Dr. Jamil's paper because it kind of touches, I think, on your own experience as a Pakistani woman. And she discusses the concept of, resilient of female, uh, resilience of female journalists. Uh, she concludes, uh, concludes female journalists in Pakistan are in fact very resilient. So they're put down, even attacked because of their gender. Uh, but having to deal with all of these challenges has forced them to keep trying and find new ways. Uh, how does it shape women in journalism to have to fight for their place in that way? So that's a very, and that's a very good point. And thank you for asking that question. I do want to point out that I think that we are seeing this resilience in a lot of countries. Um, and Pakistan is one great example. One of the most significant things that I really liked about Dr. Jamil's paper was that it goes into the post-colonial um, aspect of it, how West you know, press freedom and gender equality in media is different uh, from the West um, versus, you know, post-colonial countries like Pakistan. India and Bangladesh are one of them. Um, and I think the landscape is very similar. So it's important to point out that um, the elements of misogyny that are already there in these societies, um, like Pakistan, um, they kind of add to the other challenges that women are uh, facing in the industry. Um, and I think that that social aspect versus industry aspect, right? So I think that Pakistan kind of the landscape sustains the press freedom challenges that we are facing in other countries, but you add the post-colonial complexity to it. And that just, um, uh, that sort of changes the what can work in that country. Um, I think that um, resilience is something that uh, we have seen consistent um, amongst a lot of women journalists in Pakistan. We, um, the, uh, our organization, we have chapters in different countries. Pakistan is one of them. And um, we have 20 core members in Pakistan. 20 of our core members in Pakistan were attacked in the last one and a half year. And in all of these cases, we have seen that women journalists in Pakistan have been able to um, fight back. I would like to mention a few examples. And I think that resilience of like contesting the violations that they're facing really helps with, um, you know, creating the friction, um, you know, for for tro online trolls as well as other threats that women journalists face. So I think that um, one of our members, Asma Shirazi, uh, w was being consistently attacked in Pakistan for two years and um, Eventually, I mean, she has all constantly, uh, you know, uh, uh, fought back against those attacks through her reporting, um, but also, um, you know, went uh, legally against the state and questioned the state not taking action. I think that kind of uh, resilience really helps uh, because. Um, in Pakistan, I mean, uh, there are all kinds of there are all kinds of ways where women journalists are attacked through by society, right wing, this and that. But uh, so I don't want to squarely blame the government, but the current sitting government in Pakistan has been very ignorant of the attacks, um, as well as sometimes participating on online attacks against women journalists to create pressure. So to contest that and to confront um, uh, you know, the government um, and ask, request the government to take action um, is a is, uh, is a very helpful step that we think that can really, um, you know, help in creating the friction friction that is needed. Um, and yes, then Ms. I think Nasich, that, I'm sorry, uh, I I am going to interrupt you. I'm so sorry, but we uh, have to round up. Uh, thank you so much for all of your insights and talking to us uh, live. Uh, and now we are moving on to the last round, paper round three. Thank you. Thank you. Journalists in small communities are closer to local politicians than national or international journalists are to national or international politicians. The third topic of this conference focuses on the safety aspects of this relationship. We will focus on research in Nigeria. Are journalists there forced to change their reports because they're in grave danger if they don't? Also, we will take a closer look at journalist safety in uh, electoral context and the way in which local politics shapes uh, media freedom in Latin America. 
A third research points out that cooperation among national, regional and international actors is extremely important for, the health, for healthy democracies to be able to flourish as well as to ensure the safety of journalists and human rights defenders. Please allow me to introduce Dr. Baba Bhado and Dr. Adepad Mustafa Koiki. Dr. Bahado is an associate research professor at the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University in the United States. And Dr. Arepade Mustafa Koyiki is a lecturer and a researcher at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Their research sits at the intersection of media, conflict and peace building. While journalists are supposed to be objective and independent in order to enhance and strengthen democracy, what happens when they work in conflict zones and are the targets of intimidation and violence by combatants with preferred media frames and narratives? Do they change their stories and framing to appease the attackers? And if so, how do they do it? In our study, we examined how three attacks by Boko Haram on Nigerian journalists and the media sector for alleged misrepresentations in 2011 and 2012 impacted their coverage of the group and its activities. This is done through a detailed content analysis of Nigerian newspaper headlines and a round of in-depth interviews with Nigerian journalists. So what were our results? Our results suggested that the media coverage did change after attacks by Boko Haram on journalists and the media industry. We looked at three factors in headlines, labeling, whether Boko Haram was mentioned specifically, blame, whether they were blamed for the conflict and crisis, and framing, whether it was episodic or thematic, with Boko Haram preferring thematic framing. For all these factors, we found notable changes in the direction Boko Haram wanted after the attacks. We also interviewed journalists and we found that journalists explained that they wanted to reduce risk themselves. So as a result, they changed both their journalistic routines and their framing of stories. We envision following up this research in at least three ways. First, since the study involved newspaper-based research, we envision expanding to other mediums such as, so, um, such as the TV news social media. Second, we will aim to go beyond analysis of newspaper headlines and examine the content of articles in depth. Finally, since we have essentially conducted a case study of just one country, which is Nigeria, we would like to examine more conflict fragile countries to see if similar trends occur when journalists were attacked by different combatants. This will be useful in gaining insight into the risk that journalists beyond the shores of Nigeria is why reporting on terror. Up next is Kyung Matsaro. She is a PhD candidate at the City University of New York, studying elections, violence, and media freedom in Latin America. These are also recurring themes in her research about she, which, uh, which she will now tell us. With anti-media public discourse increasingly espoused by democratic and also not so democratic leaders worldwide, there have been increasing concerns about the effect of anti-media rhetoric on the safety of journalists. In this paper, focusing on Chavez's Venezuela, a paradigmatic case of a government that espouses this anti-media rhetoric, I investigate the question of whether and how anti-media public discourse may facilitate violence against journalists. In my analysis, I show that although public officials may um, avoid making explicit calls for violence against journalists, anti-media messages increase the incidence of physical attacks against journalists. 
Looking at the Venezuelan case, I content analyzed over 696 anti-media messages featuring government officials and used data on the timing and location of physical attacks by non-state actors against journalists during Chavez's presidency. Both my estimates from Cox models and instrumental variables show that the frequency of anti-media messages is positively associated with the hazard of violence against journalists. Although the case of Chavez's Venezuela is in many ways paradigmatic, anti-media public discourse in Venezuela is also in many ways unique. In that sense, one could argue that anti-media public discourse may have a different effect on the hazard of violence against journalists depending on electoral institutions, the history of violence against journalists, levels of democratization, or the ideology of leaders. In that sense, it would be important to continue studying the effect of anti-media discourse on violence against journalists looking at other cases around the world. And last but not least, we will hear from experienced media and gaming consultant Michelle Betts. She's a senior media development consultant which, with close to 15 years of experience in project design, implementation and management. Her areas of expertise include media in conflict and post-conflict media, uh, military media relations and rapid response interventions. Every year, hundreds of human rights defenders, journalists, and aid workers are killed. Many more are threatened, sexually harassed, or arrested. Yet, there has been little coordination or collaboration with regards to safety between these sectors. My research has set out to look at two specific areas. What, if any, commonalities exist between these three sectors with regards to safety and protection issues? And second, what opportunities exist for these sectors to work together to address safety and protection issues? So despite these commonalities, there's been little cooperation or coordination to ensure the safety of workers in these three sectors or to share best practices and lessons learned. And there are clearly numerous opportunities for dialogue or coordination on a number of issues. What are these issues? They're they include the following, slap lawsuits, gender specific issues such as gender based violence, restrictive legislation of NGOs and media or media workers, uh, and, as well as humanitarian and aid workers, uh, surveillance and data and privacy issues, the SDGs, especially, especially numbers 16 and 5, uh, could be areas ripe for coordination as well. And finally, something that we're seeing more and more during the COVID-19 pandemic is information pollution. Lots of myths and disinformation uh, that is affecting how these three sectors operate. How are safety issues interlinked with the social standing of human rights and journalism? There's also an opportunity, I think, to examine the threats against women human rights defenders, women journalists and media workers, and women aid workers, and looking at how these are or are not dealt with. And finally, I think something that, that we have missed the boat on quite a bit is the need to evaluate. We're not evaluating the effectiveness of many of these protection mechanisms. Uh, so I think we need to evaluate the effectiveness, effectiveness of different protect, protection mechanisms uh, and, and look and contrast and compare within these three sectors. Thank you very much. We are delighted that Claudia Cadena is with us today to reflect on this particular subject. Ms. Cadena currently leads the project Voices de Sur, de Sur promoting uh, press freedom and uh, freedom of expression in Latin America. Welcome, Ms. Cadena. Thank you. What has impressed you most from the presentations we've had today? Um, in general, I think uh, what impresses me most is the range of threats, risks, and challenges that are faced by journalists across the world and how this actually uh, may change or are impacted by, by the context or the actors and how 
they basically evolve across context. So we, um, according to where we are or the region where we are, or even our gender, uh, the subject of, of the kind of attacks that a journalist can um, experience, um, they change. I think uh, it is very interesting to see the connections of things that we would think are not harmless, like anti-media discourse and how that could actually lead to more violence against journalists. Is um, It's very interest interesting to think about how the impact of, of discourse actually, um, of what discourse actually has in the media. And I think that that has been um, the case, not only in Venezuela, but in a lot of countries in Latin America, where we've seen this growing anti-media discourse um, and how, um, and I think it's just very, very important to um, make that connection on how that actually leads to more violence and attacks against journalists and the media. Um, I also find very, very interesting uh, the research by Dr. Bajador and uh, Mustafa Koiki and how they show that how attacks against journalists actually can change reporting um, and how journalists are addressing uh, certain aspects. And I think that as, uh, that could impact our societies uh, as a whole, as we citizens are not able to receive information um, just because journalists are in fear or the la or, of, or of their lives or are felt threatened uh, by the work they do. Uh, finally, I would like to highlight um, uh, the paper by um, Michelle Betts. I think it's really interesting, the lack of cooperation that exists between these three key groups, uh, human rights activists, humanitarian um, activists, and journalists. Um, as many of their, uh, as she portrays in her paper, um, they suffer s s um, several attacks that are similar, have similar and actually have similar objectives of protecting human rights, uh, protecting development, pro um, protecting democracy. So I think um, that I think it would be very important to promote this cooperation, uh, promote collaboration and ensure that uh, we can uh, support democratic institutions uh, and support systems that um, provide the safety of journalists human and human rights activists at the same time. Thank you. I think you've partially touched on, on, on my second question. What challenges do you face promoting press freedom and uh, freedom of expression in Latin America? Uh, yeah, I actually do think that one of the biggest challenges is the anti-media discourse um, that has been grown. And we've seen this in the past decade in Latin America, uh, both from the right and left side of the political spectrum in the past decade. Uh, where governments basically call the media as like the enemy of the people. And we've seen this in countries like Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, Nicaragua, and Argentina. And I think more recently, we're also seeing it in Brazil, Mexico, El Salvador, and other countries. And this definitely um, has led to a more hostile environment against journalists and the media, uh, which I, I do think is characterized by an increase in attacks against journalists and the press, um, and a feeling that the violence against the media is justified. Uh, in, in the project that I'm working with in Voces del Sur, it, only last year with, with 10 countries, we, we recorded over 2,500 uh, alerts on freedom of expression. Uh, most, of, uh, most of this were actually committed by state actors. Yeah. So it just kind of shows um, really the, the environment that is being created by, uh, by governments. Uh, I think this is also being, um, uh, or there's also a tendency to approve new laws uh, that they might seem harmless at first, like against uh, hate speech, defamation, discrimination, and others, but then um, they are discretionary and basically are used to shut the press uh, and um, issue sanctions or lawsuits against journalists, which also create additional threats and additional fear, um, and therefore just uh, contributing to this hostile, um, hostile environment against journalists, which makes it really hard to, for journalists to uh, continue with their job and um, also uh, just harder to promote freedom of the press and freedom of expression in general. Some opportunities, perhaps? Uh, yes, I think there are immense opportunities. I, I would like to uh, kind of refer to Michelle's Betts' uh, paper as well. I think there are is an immense opportunity for co collaboration, coalition building, and especially building the capacity of civil society organizations and, and media organizations so that they can conduct effective international advocacy and put pressure in governments. We have seen that many Latin American governments still care about uh, the, how they are seen internationally. So international pressure can have an effective impact. And this is uh, always more impactful when there is uh, collaboration 
I also do think that in general, Latin American journalism has played a major role in empowering people with information and supporting democracy in the region. Um, I think it has proved resilience, uh, quality and innovation. And I think that with the new technology and new tools, there's space for even more innovation and finding opportunities to continue to provide information to people and to continue uh, to inform and um, think of different ways on how uh, journalism can evolve and um, continue to make a difference and empower people and support democracy. What needs to be done finally to make your job easier? Uh, I think um, it would be what needs to be done would be a better understanding in general by governments of their role in providing safety and protection for journalists. I think more specifically, uh, building systems that uh, and mechanisms in place that allow for the protection of life, integrity, and property of journalists and the media, and that actually ensure that crimes um, against the journalists um, don't go unpunished. Um, because if there is if there is impunity, crimes will continue. So I think uh, building a system that allows I, for the protection of journalists and where Ms. journalists Ms. Feel Ms. Safe, Cardena, uh, I Yes. I had to interrupt you. Uh, uh, we are running out of time. Thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Sure. Thank you. And thanks again to Peter Tervelde, Keran Nazish and Claudia Cadena for sharing their knowledge and thought with us today. Uh, but now it is time for the paper chat sessions. And during this part of the conference, you'll be able to take a closer look at a few papers. That is why we have three separate chat rooms which will be active simultaneously. In each of these chat rooms, two or three authors will elaborate on their research, after which they will take questions from and discuss their work with the audience. In chat rooms with three presenters, each will have 20 minutes in total, five minutes to present their work and 15 to discuss it with the audience. In chat rooms with only two presenters, each will have five minutes to present and 25 to discuss their work with the audience. There will be one Leiden University scholar per chat room who will act as moderator. Please choose the chat room which sparks your interest, uh, listen to the researchers of your choice and join the conversation. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Enjoy.